Hello, everyone, and welcome to this quick quake briefing. Before I hand it over to our host and moderator, I want to take a moment to say a few brief words about EERI. EERI is the leading nonprofit membership organization dedicated to connecting people who are reducing earthquake risk. We've been bringing people and disciplines together since 1948. And by joining EERI, you can become a member of this global community and also help us make events like this one, uh, this webinar today focusing on Alaska possible. Now I'm gonna turn it over to our chapter president, Volkan Sevilgen, to introduce the Northern California chapter. Hi everyone, my name is Volkan Sevilgen, I'm the chapter president, and I would like to welcome everyone to our quick, quick briefings. Um, our Northern California chapter is dedicated reducing earthquake risk in Northern California. And the best way of doing this would be learning from our international colleagues. And for that purpose, we designed quick, quick briefings. So we learn from each other and apply those experiences in Northern California uh, risk mitigation. I will hand it uh, the virtual microphone to Bruce Mason, who is our chapter secretary, and he will talk about how you can know about these events in the future and how you can join our chapter's emailing list. Thank you. Welcome everyone to our quick quake briefing number seven that deals with the magnitude 8.2 earthquake that occurred offshore Alaska about two months ago. Two months ago. First though, I would like to mention next month's briefing that will be on the Haiti earthquake that occurred in August. But this one, that one will be a regular learning from earthquakes webinar. And that means it's a larger program and it'll have more speakers. So it's not a quick quake briefing. We will not have our quick quake briefing in October, but we're planning one for November. So you'll be stay tuned for an announcement that'll come out late October with regard to uh, that briefing. Now, what I would like to do is, could you go to the next slide, please? Oh no, it's this one, I'm sorry. Okay, it's been pointed out that I, I, our Quick Quake briefing program is intended to be free and it's open to every, anyone can be able to view the briefings. However, to get an announcement, you need to be a member of EERI. If you're not currently a member but want to get an announcement, please send your request to that email address as shown. Or better yet, join EERI for it's a great organization. And if you join for a small additional fee, you can join the Northern California chapter of which I am a member. And if you do, you'll be have access to more events. With the COVID situation, we have not been meeting in person, but we look forward to starting in-person meetings early next year. We usually have fabulous person uh, meetings in San Francisco where we have a technical talk and then we have a social time where you can network and meet other exciting individuals working in the earthquake engineering field. So having said that, I'd like to now go back to today's briefing. On July 28th, a magnitude 8.2 earthquake occurred offshore Alaska. It is one of the largest earthquakes to occur since the great a Good Friday earthquake of 1964. Today, we have two speakers that are joining us from Alaska. The first will discuss the seismology of this recent earthquake, and the second will talk about tsunami aspects that resulted from this earthquake. Here is our format. Each of our presenters today will talk for 20 minutes and we will have a question and answer period at the end. We encourage questions from the audience and how you will do that is you will hit, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a Q&A button. Press that button and type in your questions. Then Vulcan behind the scenes will go over the questions and he will come back later in the program and pose the questions to our speakers. Now we recognize that we might have more questions than we have time. So both of our speakers today kindly have put their email addresses in their presentations 
So you can be able to send them questions directly. And over the coming days, they will try to answer your questions. Now, what I would like to do is introduce our first speaker. Dr. Michael West is the Alaska State Seismologist located in Fairbanks, Alaska. He will present on the seismological mechanisms of the earthquake, its relation to other recent earthquakes, and how this earthquake influences our thinking about future earthquakes. Let's warmly welcome Dr. West. Dr. West, please proceed. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, please give me a sign if, uh, if you're not hearing me. Or, Bruce, am I coming through okay? It looks good. The, Mike, right it looks screen? good. Thank you. Um, hey, I appreciate this invitation to present to y'all. And I know that you are the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, but this is a somewhat unusual earthquake for its size in that, frankly, the engineering lessons are pretty minimal. Um, unlike uh, a much more consequential earthquake that would happen, that might happen uh, on shore here in Alaska, uh, despite the uh, large magnitude of this event, I feel much of the story in this is really uh, at an earth science level. So uh, indulge me a little bit. I'm going to try to uh, present a handful of lessons or a handful of uh, uh, points to consider, if you will, that I think are relevant, uh, particularly to a California audience, and discuss how this earthquake has some relation to what's come before it, it's not a random event, um, and touch on the topic of what we might expect uh, going forward, which is always a little tricky, but I think it's, uh, I think it's quite relevant in this particular uh, case. So, to make sure we're all on the same page here, um, I assume most of this audience is well acquainted with the idea that there are plate boundaries around the earth where the tectonic plates uh, move past one another and that uh, coming up the west coast of the US and across the Aleutian Islands is the boundary of the Pacific Plate and specifically the intersection of the Pacific Plate and North America. That is what generates the vast majority of seismic activity uh, in Alaska as those two plates converge uh, and create a subduction uh, zone. There's a lot of different uh, types of seismic activity that can be traced back to that primary uh, tectonic process all across uh, the state. These are different, uh, the, these are earthquakes over the past uh, many years uh, in the historical catalog. And the color shades have some relevance to today in that the red ones are shallow, the yellow ones are at more intermediate depths and those dark brown ones can be a few hundred kilometers deep. Obviously, this is not a random pattern, and they paint out the, the subduction zone. So let's take a little look at this in cross-section. I'll try a video. If it doesn't work on, uh, on Zoom here, we'll, we'll, we'll do something else. But um, this is just a short little video that tries to illustrate this convergence process between the two plates. And you know, if we look in cross-section, really anywhere along the southern coast of Alaska, what we see is the Pacific plate being thrust down underneath North America and a, a number of different processes at work. And the key thing that we're gonna focus on uh, today is this place in between the two plates, right where they first come together, it's sort of shaded in red here, uh, an area where the two plates uh, routinely uh, experience high levels of friction and build up tremendous stresses and lead really to all of the truly massive earthquakes in the world, regardless of where they are. If you're in the magnitude eight and a half and nine range, this is pretty much the source of all of them. Okay, um, in particular for today's talk, I want to look, I want you to keep in mind uh, that there are different places along this interface, that is the, the boundary, the plate uh, boundary interface between 
these two uh, plates. There are different places along there where an earthquake might occur. You can fathom uh, in the, the illustration I have in front of you where the solid line is, kind of a, uh, an earthquake that is deeper down into the system, or the dashed line, which is shallower and a little uh, up closer to the trench, the oceanic trench where these two plates first meet. Uh, in cartoon cross-section, we could look at it like this. This is really just the same image, but shown a different way. But what I want you to focus on is this concept where the, where the two plates are together of this rupture patch. Um, this is, you know, sometimes we illustrate earthquakes on maps as uh, points in space. But for any significantly large earthquake, you're really covering, uh, you're, 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 the fault area that's rupturing can be very long in extent, hundreds of kilometers uh, commonly for large subduction earthquakes. And we refer to that sometimes as the rupture patch, the actual part of the subduction zone that is uh, where stress or where slip is released during an earthquake. If we look back over the last 80 years or so in Alaska and look at estimates of these rupture patches, and I, I wanna emphasize the word estimates, we do see some patterns. Uh, most notably, what you see is that with, with some liberties, um, over the course of the last 80 years, much of the subduction zone across the southern coast of Alaska uh, has ruptured in a series of earthquakes, some on the smaller side, some like 1965 and 1964 are, you know, truly massive uh, in, in scale. Um, in particular on this figure, I would point out a an area that has long been subject to uh, a lot of research. It's a bit of a, a, a more enigmatic section of the subduction zone that uh, for many years did not have a significant earthquake. It was sometimes referred to as the Schumigan Gap, named after the Schumigan Islands there in the region. And the word gap su suggesting that there was a hole in the earthquake uh, activity. And lo lots of uh, debate that we won't go into today about the mechanics of that. But a little over a year ago, re relevant to today's uh, story, um, there was an earthquake which occurred right in this gap uh, between the 1946 earthquake and the 1938 earthquake, both labeled uh, in here. And we're going to zoom in on that. Um, there, what I want you to focus on is the clouds of aftershocks. So all of these, both colors, the gray and the red, are aftershocks from a magnitude 7.8 earthquake last July, uh, to be clear, 2020 July, and then a follow-up earthquake uh, a little later on in the year in October. And together, those spanned, that uh, those aftershocks spanned a decent chunk of that <clears throat> so-called gap. This is a nice illustration here showing how the earthquake actually covers you know, an expanse of the subduction zone and is not a point in space. Okay, this next figure is, gets a little bit complicated, but hang with me here. This is a, a, a paper that was published earlier this year, which uh, illustrates the stress changes associated with this earthquake. As you can imagine, when an earthquake occurs, it releases stress in a lot of places, but it actually adds stresses in other places as well as the earth shifts around. Um, the relevant point for us today is, if I put uh, this dashed circle on here, we're, we're gonna get here, but that is the approximate location of the earthquake that we are discussing today, which occurred back in uh, just, a month and change ago in July. And the point, the point that I want to make here is that it occurred in an area where the stresses had been significantly changed by the earthquake a year ago. The earthquake a year ago being referred to as the, the Simeonov uh, earthquake or the Simeonov sequence of earthquakes. And the reason this is relevant is that it demonstrates pretty clearly that the earthquake in July was not some random occurrence 
but really was, you could use the word triggered by uh, the earthquake in 2020, or I suppose the, the first uh, point to consider that I would point out, I would use the word nudge. I would say that the Chignik earthquake, this earthquake, which we had uh, just here in July, the magnitude 8.2, was nudged toward failure by the earthquake a year ago. That's not to say it wouldn't have happened on its own someday, but all signs suggest that the earthquake a year ago helped push this closer to failure and uh, you know, advanced the, the time at which it, would, uh, it might have otherwise ruptured. So let's take a closer look uh, at the, the Chignik earthquake, as we refer to it, named after the, the nearest town uh, on shore and the Aleutians there of, of the town of Chignik. So now we're looking at a cloud of aftershocks from the July 28 uh, magnitude 8.2 earthquake. And this is, I want to share, uh, make sure everyone understands we're early in results for this earthquake. Things are subject to some change, but this cloud of aftershocks is one of the first indicators that we have of the approximate extent, the rupture patch, as we discussed before, of this earthquake. And uh, it, it, it is just a little bit east of the earthquake uh, last year. And one of the things I would point out is when we look at this cloud of aftershocks, um, there do not appear to be many in the shallow parts of the subduction zone. This earthquake originated at 35 kilometers below the surface, which is relatively deep down that interface. <clears throat> So if we go back to our cartoon from earlier on, we were talking about this. We have this locked zone, this place where the two uh, plates are impinging on one another. And it is possible to rupture either the deep area of that subduction zone, the shallow area, or you could certainly rupture both uh, in an earthquake. And all signs so far suggest, actually demonstrate pretty clearly already, that this earthquake was in the deeper part of the subduction zone. The relevance of that really comes to uh, summer's topics uh, later on, and the uh, the the are in have some well, the location of the earthquake in the rupture zone or in the locked zone impacts how tsunamigenic it can be. So this is from a recent study. Uh, there's a lot going on on this slide, but I would draw your attention to the bottom panels. These are scenarios, these are models for four different earthquakes. These are the rupture patches for four different similarly sized earthquakes in this area. Um, the difference being on the left, the earthquake is deep in the interface down 35 kilometers where this one occurred. And then out to the right hand side, you have a very, very shallow earthquake up near the surface. And the top illustration here, the top figure, shows the modeled or the estimated uh, you know, tsunami waves from these different earthquakes. And the take home point is that the shallower uh, earthquakes, the earthquake shallow in the subduction zone, can produce uh, more significant uh, tsunami waves. So that kind of gets us to the second take home point from this earthquake, which is the, the Chignik earthquake uh, was certainly capable of producing uh, a damaging tsunami, but because it appeared, because it occurred deep along the interface, it explains in part, not fully, but in part, uh, why its behavior uh, was so. All right, moving along here, I'm gonna beat this cartoon to death here for a little while. And I, I wanna talk about uh, the degree to which subduction zones are locked or slipping. You can imagine that where these two plates uh, impinge on one another, if that zone was somehow well lubricated uh, and was not able to build up to, to uh, you know, create friction and build up stress, it might not be as prone to catastrophic earthquakes. And in fact, there are many processes which do, uh, loosely speaking, lubricate subduction zones. Uh, lots of sediments in the incoming trench and 
uh, things like this. <clears throat> so that idea that some areas of the subduction zone are locked more than others and that some slip more freely can be illustrated in a figure like this. This is from a recent uh, paper based on geodetic data using data from GPS or GNSS stations. It's possible to infer what areas of the subduction zone are always just quietly slipping and presumably not building up large amounts of stress and compare those to areas of the subduction zone that we believe are locked and therefore accumulating the full rate of strain uh, that would be uh, created by the, uh, the colliding plates. So in this figure, and just to get your spatial reference, uh, don't worry about the aftershocks, but all of those circles uh, and the, the yellow star is the 2020 earthquake, maybe a good visual cue for you would be the island of Kodiak, which is up in the top right corner. You'll see the outline of an island. Kodiak will be a good uh, visual reference point over the next few slides. Uh, anyway, um, common belief right now, based on these geodetic data primarily, is that uh, as you move westward, uh, down toward the lower part of this figure, down past the Schumagen Islands, you have basically a very slippery subduction zone uh, where less stress uh, tends to build up. Um, but we have in the areas that are red or orange, these are areas that experience much more stress uh, buildup. And I would point out that those areas tend to be much closer to the trench, much closer to the surface and the, uh, the, where the Pacific plate arrives. So if we kind of pencil in roughly where this earthquake was a few, uh, you know, some weeks ago, um, what I would share, what I would point out, and we touched on this a moment ago, is there does not appear to be much evidence for any, uh, for that this earthquake involved the shallow parts of the subduction zone. It appears to have been deeper, meaning that all those areas out near the trench, the areas in red, uh, did not slip in this earthquake. And if you can puzzle this out in your head, if you take the lower part of the subduction zone and, of the plate and pull it further into the earth, then you're actually adding stress to the shallow portion of the interface. So all signs would suggest that this earthquake if anything, would add stress uh, and potentially make shallow earthquakes more likely. That is of relevance, and particularly if you're sitting in California, because this section of the Aleutian subduction zone has been specifically singled out as you know, one of the more or the most uh, you know, tsunamogenic regions or tsunamogenic threats for the West Coast of the US. When the USGS, the California survey, together with NOAA, undertook a, a major uh, tsunami response and modeling effort some years ago, 2013 timeframe, um, they chose a scenario, a tsunami scenario generated directly out of this region. It points on a, you know, a three-dimensional globe. This area of the subduction zone points to the West Coast and it has this shallow subduction zone uh, rupture potential. So the third talking point out of this earthquake for me is that the Chignik and the, the, the Simeonov, that 2020 earthquake as well, have probably made shallow ruptures in this area more likely. Now, I will tell you, there's plenty of debate about this uh, in the literature, um, but we're not talking about esoteric earth science, you know, plate tectonics debates here. We're talking about the potential for, you know, once in a generation type earthquakes. So it matters to get this right. Um, so watch that as it un unfolds uh, in the you know, months and years to come in the literature. Now, one last point here we'll march through. I'm gonna go back to this figure this figure showing where the subduction zone is more locked 
in red and where is not, and the approximate location of the earthquake that just occurred. Um, a very logical next question is, well, how does this relate to that area further to the east, that big locked zone, that big red area, which is red for a reason, it should get our attention. Um, and in order to put this in perspective, we need to go back to 1964. So uh, as was mentioned, as Bruce mentioned at the beginning of this uh, in the introduction, you know, the 1964 earthquake uh, magnitude 9.2 was really a, a, a seminal event in earth science history and certainly forever changed the place where I live now, killed people across uh, wide swaths of the West Coast. Um, and I think it's worth putting it, putting this earthquake in the context of 1964. So remember, put your eyes on where Kodiak is here. We're going to see Kodiak in the next figure. So we're zooming out. This is uh, the, the whole southern coast of Alaska. And all of this, these little uh, red checked squares, this is a model, uh, one of the better models that we have for how the subduction zone ruptured during the 1964 earthquake. So all of the, the warmer colors, your, your oranges, your reds, these are areas that are thought to have slipped by 10 and 15 meters on the interface. So we're talking about inside that subduction zone, the amount of movement. And the, a couple of take home points from this is we know, we understand fairly well these days that the, the 1964 earthquake had uh, you know, started up in Prince William Sound, it started in the, the top right of this figure and propagated down to the left over the course of four or five minutes. And much of the movement during that earthquake occurred kind of toward the two ends then another blurb uh, in the middle. But what I wanna show, what the take home point for us today is that here off of Kodiak Island, there was substantial movement and if we add in our earthquake from a month or two uh, ago, very roughly penciled in here, um, it raises a lot of questions about in between those two areas. That area ruptured in 1938. There's, uh, we've got some good models uh, for that earthquake, but a lot of uncertainty uh, resides or exists around this particular area. And given that it is, uh, that we know that that area is well locked, building up lots of stress, certainly capable of large earthquakes. Um, I think uh, the last sort of take home point from this is that the region between the Chignik earthquake and between there and Kodiak Island can produce extremely large earthquakes. And again, this is, you're gonna see a slew of papers over the next year or two uh, on this topic. Uh, maybe not all seeing eye to eye, but all signs would suggest that the Chignik earthquake has probably made a failure in this area uh, more, uh, more plausible. So I could go on. There's a lot of interesting things coming from this earthquake, um, but I think these points, though they are rooted in kind of very basic uh, earth science uh, material here, I think are, are have wide relevance. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time and I'll take... Thank you. I don't know if we're doing questions now or later, later no. I think, at the end, right? No, yeah, yeah. I, I, you, you can hear me now, correct? I do. Okay, great. Uh, Mike, thank you very much. I, I, I want to compliment you. Your graphics was outstanding. And the other thing I'd like to say is, uh, usually when seismologists talk, they always show these beach balls, which I really don't understand. And I, I would really <laughs> appreciate that you didn't go into that uh, that much. So having said that, I'd like to move right along to our second speaker for today. And that is Dr. Summer Oldendorf. She is a science officer with NOAA, in particular, the National Tsunami Warning Center in Palmer, Alaska. She will present on the tsunami warning process following this quake and the evolution of our understanding about the tsunami that was generated. Let's warmly welcome Summer. Please proceed. All right, thanks, Bruce. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. All right, well, thanks, Mike, for setting me up and explaining the tectonic context for everyone. 
Uh, I'm aware that this audience probably doesn't have a lot of familiarity with the US tsunami warning system or how it works. So I'll aim to explain a little bit about how that uh, proceeds as I go using this quake and tsunami as an example. Uh, so I'm at the National Tsunami Warning Center in Alaska and we're one of two tsunami warning centers in the US, uh, the other being the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, so during a tsunami event, you may see messages coming from both the National Tsunami Warning Center and the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. And I wanted to take a moment to describe what each of us does. Uh, the National Tsunami Warning Center warns for both east and west coasts of the United States and Canada. And the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center has direct warning responsibility for Hawaii and the US territories, but they also have uh, some international responsibilities issuing threat information for countries that may or may not have their own tsunami warning systems. Uh, both of our warning centers are staffed 24 seven because we never know when a big earthquake or tsunami will originate. And based on the location of that tsunami source, nearest communities can be impacted in as little as 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, so time is of the essence, and that'll be a theme throughout my talk. Uh, our tsunami warning centers aim to act on the best information we have at the time during a period when uh, information is quickly flowing and understanding is uh, rapidly evolving. Uh, our tsunami warning centers also back each other up in case either center experiences uh, downtime of a certain capability. So there's some redundancy in the tsunami warning system. So I'm gonna to try to give you a very brief overview of the tsunami warning process to the extent I can in this 20 minute talk. Um, so our, uh, our processes at the tsunami warning center start with uh, a geohazard. Um, and our computer systems are working around the clock to detect hazards when they happen. Um, usually uh, a disturbance of water that causes a tsunami is uh, the result of a big earthquake, um, but we know that there are other potential tsunami sources like landslides and volcanoes. Um, so we're looking for anything that might generate a tsunami and we're trying to analyze it as quickly as possible. In the case of a large earthquake, that means we're trying to figure out where the earthquake is, how deep it is, and how big it is, uh, so we can figure out what kind of tsunami hazard it poses. Within five minutes, we're aiming to issue a first alert message, um, and which center goes first and um, uses their earthquake parameters depends on where the earthquake is. So. Uh, for an Alaska earthquake, the National Tsunami Warning Center takes point on uh, the, the seismic analysis for that event. Um, so the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center would follow the National Tsunami Warning Center with messages for their areas. And immediately after we issue a bulletin, uh, we can start to review pre-computed forecasts um, that are the, the best matches that we currently have for the earthquake that just happened. Uh, following that, we're looking to issue messages uh, incrementally. Uh, usually that's every 30 to 60 minutes. And uh, usually our second uh, message will revise the earthquake info as necessary. So we're looking to the US Geological Survey for the authoritative earthquake parameters for the event. And if you see earthquake magnitudes changing, that's why. Uh, different centers are computing their own estimates of earthquake parameters, and um, we, we look to use the best information available. So after uh, the initial seismic analysis, we're starting to look at our forecasts, and we're gathering uh, ocean observations. It takes a while to gather ocean observations because it takes time for the tsunami to propagate to uh, our sensors. So um, we have both deep ocean systems and coastal, coastal systems. And usually the deep ocean systems are the ones that are first to detect a tsunami. Um, we're able to use those deep ocean observations to scale pre-computed forecasts as well as perform inversions, uh, which lets us run higher resolution forecasts uh, giving us more information about what to expect at coastlines. Once we start getting coastal observations, uh, those can uh, confirm how good we're doing with our forecasts. 
and also give us information about what impacts uh, the coastlines are seeing. And of course, we're looking to adjust alert levels as necessary based on how our forecasts are changing and the observations that we're seeing throughout a tsunami event. So I'm just gonna show this slide as a brief summary of how our understanding of the earthquake changed throughout um, those first few hours. Um, so the origin time for this earthquake or the time when the earthquake started was uh, 6.15 UTC. And within about three minutes, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center issued what's called an information or an observatory message. Uh, so that's not a, a public product, but it goes to centers like the Alaska Earthquake Center, it goes to USGS and people like us, just to give us a, a first estimate of what they're seeing um, as far as the earthquake. Uh, the Alaska Earthquake Center published an unreviewed solution at four minutes past origin time. And you'll notice that both the initial PTWC estimate and the AEC estimate undershot the magnitude a little bit. Uh, it's really hard to get a good magnitude estimate for a, an earthquake, especially a big earthquake, um, within a couple minutes. And that's, that's why we usually stretch it out to about five minutes. Five minutes tends to be um, a good amount of time to be able to capture at least a magnitude eight earthquake relatively accurately. Um, so the National Tsunami Warning Center issued our earthquake information and our first message at five minutes past origin time. And we're, we're proud of how well we captured the full magnitude of the earthquake at that point. And we're pretty close to the final um, earthquake estimates by the US Geological Survey and by the Alaska Earthquake Center once they had a little bit more time to analyze that. So once we have our uh, earthquake parameters and we wanna issue a messages, we have to decide who to put in tsunami alerts and what alert levels to put people in. Um, so this is a summary of the different tsunami alert levels that we can choose from. Uh, the most serious being a tsunami warning. In that case, we're expecting people to take action immediately and evacuate from coastal areas because there might be inundation or flooding of the coastal area. And uh, we don't want anyone to be in harm's way. So for a tsunami warning, uh, we're anticipating forecasts of about a meter or greater. Uh, the next level down is a tsunami advisory. And a tsunami advisory implies danger pretty much just right at the coast. So there could be damage to harbors and beaches. Uh, we want people away from the shore and out of the water, um, but it's not gonna be a widespread flooding event like a tsunami warning. So for a tsunami warning or tsunami advisory, um, we would use that if we're anticipating uh, forecasted wave heights between one to three feet, which is about 0.3 to one meter. Uh, tsunami watch we use uh, when we have a source that's farther away from a particular area and are trying to more accurately determine the level of hazard before issuing an alert. Uh, so a tsunami watch needs to either be upgraded to a warning or advisory or canceled with at least two hours before the wave would impact uh, the area under the watch. Information statement is something you'll see from us all the time that's um, no action needed and information only. And then uh, threat messages are something you'll see from the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. Those are their international products um, for the areas that they don't directly warn for. Uh, so for this earthquake, uh, here's what we did with our first message. We ended up putting um, a swath of Alaska uh, consisting of southern Alaska and the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern part of the Aleutians into a tsunami warning and the surrounding areas which are the central Aleutians and southeast Alaska into a tsunami advisory. Um, for British Columbia and the U.S. west coast we had no alerts in effect. Um, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center issued a tsunami watch for Hawaii and a tsunami threat for the Pacific um, saying that uh, damaging waves were possible, widespread hazardous waves were possible. Um, so the way the Tsunami Warning Center works is that we warn coastal sections uh, between predefined uh, breakpoints. So you'll see sections of the coastline broken up into different alert levels. 
Um, and we issue these initial alerts based only on the earthquake information due to the time frame that we have for alerting. Um, in five minutes, we don't know anything actually about the tsunami. We only know about the earthquake. Uh, so these uh, initial procedures are developed uh, based on uh, different modeling scenarios, as well as historical tsunamis. And the NTWC has devoted considerable effort in recent years into putting in place uh, procedures like this one that help limit overwarning with the first message so that we don't end up, uh, say, waking up California when there's not really going to be any expected impacts. All right, so looking at our initial forecasting models for this event, uh, the US NTWC uses two main forecast models. Uh, the first is the Alaska Tsunami Forecast Model. This is a pre-computed model. And uh, the, the closest fitting one for this event uh, was uh, a little bit off. You can see the difference between the ATFM source parameters and the revised parameters right there. Uh, so ATFM sources are located at the trench. They're intended to be a kind of a worst case scenario. And uh, you'll notice the color scale of this figure is designed to emphasize the um, details of the energy propagation uh, for, from the tsunami. So red here starts at about uh, 10 to 15 centimeters, and it's not quite as scary as it looks at first glance. Um, so the Alaska tsunami forecast model um, is great because this is something we can pull up immediately and have kind of a first guess at what the tsunami might look like, um, but we know that it might overestimate the impacts a little bit. We can, however, use deep ocean measurements when we get them to help scale uh, the forecast. So if we know that this is the general pattern we expect, but it, it might be just a little too strong, and we see uh, deep ocean measurements that are lower than the model predicts, we can scale the whole uh, forecast down. Uh, the second main uh, forecasting model we use is called short-term inundation forecasting for tsunamis or SIFT. Um, this is a really nice complementary model to the ATFM because uh, it has the ability to have pre-computed sources, but it's a little bit more flexible. So this works by um, kind of combining uh, uh, modeled slip on subfaults into a best fitting source for whatever earthquake uh, occurs. Um, and one of the cool things that we can do with this model is use the time series from the deep ocean observations uh, to invert for a best fitting source and then run high resolution forecasts uh, based on that source. So this is really helpful for um, approximating the tsunami wave field to the best extent we can with just a few um, observation points. Uh, so what are those deep ocean observations? Um, we're using something called uh, DART buoy systems. Uh, DART stands for Deep Ocean Assessment and Reporting of Tsunamis. And this is uh, a map of the global network. So what these are are systems with pressure sensors sitting on the ocean floor and buoys anchored nearby. So when a tsunami wave comes over on top of the pressure sensor, it exerts more pressure down on that sensor. Um, it can trigger the, the whole system into what's called vent mode, letting tsunami warning centers know that something's going on. And the buoy sends uh, information via satellite to our centers. And I wanna point out here that uh, that vent mode may be triggered by earthquake shaking by wave activity or manually. So I know there are a lot of uh, people at home who like to go to the buoy websites and uh, check out uh, what they're showing during a tsunami. So just because you see buoys in event mode doesn't mean that they have observed a tsunami. In this case, we saw um, buoys trigger from the earthquake shaking all over the Pacific Basin and even into the Atlantic Basin. So all the buoys were working very hard. So what we actually saw on these systems during the event uh, were waves uh, that were kind of a max of about five centimeters. Uh, tsunamis tend to grow in height as they approach coastlines, so it's not uncommon for them to be really small in the deep ocean. And we can use those signals uh, to um, scale and um, invert for better forecasts. So in this case, uh, our closest DART system was 
a little too close uh, and the, the seismic shaking noise on that signal actually overwhelmed the tsunami signal. So we weren't able to use that in our forecast. I'm showing uh, the time series for DART 46414 right here. So um, on the side there, you can see a, a yellow box and a, a signal that's really shaky right before a red line. That red line is the estimated tsunami arrival time. So you can see a long curve following that red line. That's the tsunami. Um, and the big spikes right before the red line are the seismic shaking. Uh, so this is something to be aware of if you're ever looking at uh, the dart signals during an event. Um, you may see something that looks like a huge wave, but um, the time series on the, the NDBC websites um, are those pressure uh, measurements converted into water. So they're not actual water measurements and just be aware that you may be looking at some seismic shaking in addition to tsunami signals. So we were able to use a few of these uh, darts during the event to scale our forecasts and perform inversions. And this is kind of a summary of how our forecasts dur evolved during the event. Um, in general, uh, we use both forecast models and we've uh, found through uh, past tsunami events that uh, using a combination of the different forecast models tends to bring us uh, the closest matches to observations. So we're looking at both. So in this case, we were able to scale the magnitude 8.2 ATFM source with observations and uh, we were able to um, look at the magnitude 8.2 SIF source once the earthquake magnitude was revised that overestimated the tsunami a little bit. Uh, but once we were able to perform the inversions with the deep ocean system information, uh, that gave us uh, a forecast that was a little bit closer to reality. And when we combined it with ATFM, we ended up with just part of the um, epicentral area in a tsunami advisory. And that ended up matching with our coastal observations really well. So here's what we saw as far as observations at the coast during the tsunami events. Um, and the observed heights were all below one foot actually during the event. Um, so that's below our advisory threshold and certainly not big enough to cause any tsunami damage. And here's how those forecasts and observations fit into the information that we were issuing during the event. Uh, we ended up issuing seven messages over the course of about three hours. Um, message five was our most significant point. That was at about two hours past um, the origin time of the earthquake. And at that point, uh, we had enough information from both coastal observations and from the darts to have updated forecasts and um, be able to um, downgrade our warning areas to a tsunami advisory and cancel the area, cancel alerts for the areas that were previously in a tsunami advisory. Um, so our final coastal observations are actually a little bit bigger. Um, this is a good time to remind everyone that with tsunami waves, the first wave may not be the biggest. And um, our alert levels are meant to build in uncertainty in the forecast, uh, as well as um, uh, account for the fact that the first wave may not be the biggest. So there's a little bit of a uh, uh, buffer there between uh, our start of our advisory threshold at 0.3 meters and what we call a significant tsunami at 0.5 meters, which is where we historically start seeing tsunami damage at the coast. And uh, if you're familiar with um, beach waves, uh, half a meter wave may not sound like a lot, but um, for uh, tsunamis are such uh, long, powerful waves. Uh, they have really significant current strength that accompany their arrival. Um, even a, a one and a half foot tsunami wave can do some damage in harbors. Uh, so I wanted to briefly contrast uh, this tsunami with an, another relatively recent one, the magnitude 8.1 tsunami, or Samoa tsunami in 2009. Uh, so that one was an outer rise earthquake, or it was on uh, the downgoing plates um, 
on the other side of the trench. And that one was a, a little more shallow than this one, but not too much. Uh, however, it had a very highly damaging tsunami. So I'm showing um, the USGS finite fault calculations there, which are estimates of how much uh, different parts of the fault slipped during that earthquake. And you can see that um, the, the slip is kind of concentrated right near the trench in really deep water. And the slip is also um, kind of all the way to, to the surface and very high up to about 16 meters slip. So this was uh, the same size earthquake, but wave heights were over 10 meters um, in the near field in American Samoa and wave, waves arrived within about 15 to 20 minutes. So this was a, a really terrible um, case. So why is the tsunami from this earthquake so much smaller? Um, largely it's because of the water depth here. So the, the high percenter depth or the depth where this earthquake um, started was about 32 kilometers. Um, that's relatively deep, but uh, not super deep. Uh, however, the notable thing is that that epicenter uh, what the water depth at the epicenter was only 85 meters. So compared to 6,000 meters at the trench, um, there was not a lot of water above where the earthquake happened to move around to cause a big tsunami. Um, so I, I'd like to point out here too that um, the, the wave from the magnitude 8.2 ended up being uh, comparable to uh, the 7.6 and the 7.8 in 2020. Um, for this one, uh, the observation at Sandpoint was 41 centimeters. Um, for the thrust event in July of 2020, that was the 7.8. Um, the observation at Sandpoint was only 23 centimeters, so about half the size. And for the 7.6, um, that actually had kind of the largest tsunami observations of, of the three, even though it was a strike slip event. Um, and you might have noticed from the aftershock pattern that Mike showed earlier, the aftershocks crept towards the trench from the 7-6. Uh, so we think that part of the reason why that tsunami uh, may have been a bit bigger than the other two is because it did involve uh, movement of some fault that was below some of the deeper water there. Um, so I wanted to, to highlight some of these factors that we think contributed to the rather modest tsunami size from this earthquake. Um, the, the slip was pretty spread out over uh, the patch of the fault that slipped. Um, so you can see that the, the max slip in this USGS finite fault inversion is only about two and a half to, to three meters in contrast to that 16 meter slip we saw in the Samoa case. Um, the epicenter wasn't right at the trench, it was 35 kilometers deep. So if you've got a, a deeper um, earthquake rupture, it's not gonna uh, move the ocean floor quite as much. And we also had very shallow water, again, above the rupture patch. So the volume of water above where the earthquake occurred that could be moved uh, by that earthquake wasn't nearly as big as it could have been if um, the earthquake had occurred beneath the deeper water. And we've noticed too that these observations are pretty consistent with tsunami observations from the 1938 magnitude 8.2. Uh, in 1938, uh, that was a similarly uh, broadly observed tsunami with um, wave measurements in Hawaii, California, et cetera. Um, but um, in that case, uh, the amplitudes were about the same size as uh, from this tsunami. So my main takeaways for you here, every event is different. It seems like uh, with every big earthquake, there's at least some element of surprise for us. Um, it's important here that uh, the earthquake magnitude uh, the earthquake mechanism, you know, whether it, this fault moves mostly side to side or more up and down, uh, even that doesn't tell us everything we need to know about the tsunami. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns, especially in the initial stages as uh, understanding of the earthquake is uh, really quickly evolving. We don't know if uh, there's the potential for any landslides to have been triggered. 
uh, et cetera, just based on the earthquake information. So we need actual water level observations to start understanding the tsunami that was created. And lastly, um, it's critical for tsunami warning centers to be conservative with our initial warnings uh, due to all of these unknowns and the potential time until impact. So when you're talking about communities that may be 15 to 20 minutes away, uh, we wanna make sure that we're not undershooting the warning on, on that first message um, because we need people to be moving uh, just in case it's, it's one of the more worst case scenarios. Uh, so with that, I'll note that we'll have an AGU presentation on this tsunami. There's my contact information, and I'll say thank you to all my colleagues at the NTWC and PTWC. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Ollendorf. Thank you again for a very outstanding presentation. Your graphics, again, were, were excellent. I really like the idea that you didn't have too many words on many of them. I learned a lot. Our time is moving along quickly. What I would like to do is turn control over to Vulcan. I think we'll have time for perhaps one or two questions. So Vulcan, can you please uh, take over with question and answer period? Thank you, Bruce. Michael, first question would be, how confident are we about the gap between Chignik and Kodiak Islands? And whether or not there's a possibility that previous earthquakes that we haven't yet known uh, or discovered in the historical records that could rupture in that area? And also, the, can you tell anything about the recurrence interval of these areas in general? Yeah, uh, as for our confidence uh, in that area, I'd say we have very little at all. I, I put a question mark on my slide there <clears throat> because I think that accurately reflects it. Um, the 1938 earthquake probably uh, relieved uh, a, a reasonable amount of uh, slip or strain in the area. Um, we do have some historical knowledge there, but really uh, it, it gets pretty limited. It largely comes from paleo tsunami uh, data and uh, that work has been providing a really good record, but it too has got, it, it's hard to nail down uh, some of the, the real specific uh, areas along the subduction zone. From it, so I, I feel like I'm evading the question a little bit. I do not want to say that we've got a really clear idea of what's happening there uh, at all. Um, Thanks no. so much. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No, this is uh, actually this is a very good answer. Um, Summer, if you had unlimited budget for tsunami warning centers, what would you do? Where would you put all of your money into? <laughs> What a wonderful question. Um, certainly we need more observations, um, but I think uh, more research into uh, how we might be able to better model some of these unconventional um, tsunami sources like landslides and warn for them is important too. Um, there's a lot of complexity in uh, earthquake ruptures that we can't model in real time right now uh, with our tsunami forecasts, and it would be great to be able to fit that better in addition to, you know, obviously having more deep ocean observations, which will speed up our time until we can issue um, high quality forecasts and, and things like that. All right, that's, that's great. Bruce, do you have any more questions? You know, I do. I have one quick question. This would be for Summer. Uh, my compliments that you have to make a decision within five minutes after the earthquake. But my question is this, is it a, who makes that decision? You have the state, you've got national, you mentioned you got USGS, NOAA. I, how was that decision made? Is that like over the phone or is, this, is there a rigid hierarchy? How was that decision made? Who's responsible for that? So the initial alerts are set by the tsunami warning centers um, according to uh, those uh, preset procedures that I, I alluded to a little earlier. Um, those procedures are based on you know, modeling on historical tsunami observations, things like that. And the, those are socialized in advance. Um, so people kind of have an idea of what alerts to expect from us. Um, but um, it's then our job to communicate that and we're immediately in touch with um, 
state emergency operations centers, uh, government in Canada, um, representatives from uh, National Weather Service, weather forecast offices, um, US okay. Navy, US Coast Guard. So uh, all of those groups have their own response plans um, to respond to whatever alerts we issue. Okay, so am I correct to understand that, let's say the state of California would make the decision? In other words, you would send a warning and then what the state would make their own actions as to what they do? I, I'm just curious how that works. So, so we can um, let the state know which areas we're putting under tsunami warning, under tsunami advisory, et cetera. It's up to the state to translate okay. that into actions on the ground. Who needs to be evacuated? Do you, sirens need to be set off? Okay. Um, how the logistics are actually going to work based on our alert levels. Okay, great, great. Okay, very good. Thank you, because it was very informative, and I find that it's a lot of responsibility you have, because uh, these can be devastating events. We're reaching the end of our 60-minute program. Uh, we could go on with questions, I'm sure, for a long time, so uh, the audience can email our participants, and they'll try to answer your questions. What I'd like to do, though, is turn control back over to Elizabeth to close out today's program. And I would like to sincerely thank both of our speakers today for excellent presentations. Um, please proceed, uh, Elizabeth. Great. Thank you so much to both our speakers again and to Volkan and Bruce for hosting us. Um, and thank you for everyone for joining us today. I just want to ask you to please complete the post-webinar survey that we're going to send out by email, which will help us um, create more and better events for you in the future. And you can learn more about ERI and how to join us at our website and find out about uh, upcoming webinars by reading our Pulse newsletter or by joining the Northern California chapters mailing list. Finally, we want to thank FEMA for supporting this webinar and also thank ERI members for helping make events like this possible. Thanks and have a great day.